Without talent and being weak, he became leader of the strongest clan. If you dig my recaps don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. In their childhood six kids made a pact to become treasure hunters in search of wealth and glory. While the protagonist didn't feel as excited about it all thinking he wasn't good enough the rest of the group was certain they would one day make it to the capital Zabrudia. In this world treasure hunters are like celebrities in the imperial capital traveling the world in search of ruins called treasure vaults where precious objects are stored. It's a dangerous job where adventurers face creatures known as phantoms. One of the top level clans in the capital called First Step is holding interviews at a bar to recruit new members. Since a hunter can't get far on their own, most try to join groups like this to become stronger. Unfortunately, the protagonist didn't make the cut. His name is Cry Andri, a shy boy who gets approached by a girl precisely because of his calm and introspective demeanor. In such a tense atmosphere around the bar, she thought this boy seemed friendlier and decided to strike up a conversation. Her name is Ruder Runbeck, a hunter who has just been promoted to level three. The girl extends her hand to greet the stranger, but he only says his name and doesn't respond to the handshake. Not paying much attention to it, Ruda comments on how many people showed up for the interview saying she had even tried hunting alone, but that the White Wolf's Den Vault was too much for her, which is why she wants to join a clan. Out of nowhere, an obnoxious man interrupts the conversation questioning how a level 3 hunter could have gone to the White Wolf's Den, stating that it's not a place for weaklings and that the first step is a renowned clan and won't accept a rookie like her. Ruda gets angry and replies that the ad allowed hunters of any level pulling out her daggers to go after the guy, but one of the clan members steps in to end the argument. Inside the bar Ruda is impressed by the number of people participating in the selection process as it's her first time in such an event. On the other hand, it's Cry's fifth attempt. Internally, he reflects that talented hunters rise quickly through the ranks and make a living, but those without talent have to cling to the few opportunities they get and keep trying until they succeed. Ruda asks about the group dressed in white that stands out and Cry explains they are the Ark Brave children of the Holy Spirit and the strongest among the clans recruiting. They manage to complete a level 7 vault with just 6 members. The man sitting with them is Ark Rodden, the silver lightning leader of the group. As a level 7 hunter he guarantees success for anyone he recruits, but as far as anyone knows he's never taken on anyone new in events like this. With that said, Ruda wants to know about the table at the back that no one is at. Cry explains, and the man who insulted Ruda earlier Greg Zangief reappears against the girl's wishes explaining that the table belongs to the group that founded First Step, they are the Stragi. Cry recalls that the Stragi are young talents who came to the capital a few years ago and are considered one of the strongest groups today. The clan's official name is Strange Grief. Curiously, they are the group formed by his childhood friends. Greg mentions that the Stragi are accepting new members after many years which is why the place is packed but that the clan's presence is just a rumor with nothing confirmed. Whether it's a rumor or not a warrior bursts in arrogantly declaring he's going to join Strange Grief and doesn't have time for losers. He claims he'll be the strongest hunter alive already at level 4 and is considering allowing the strongest group to recruit him. Suddenly a girl named Tino steps in to put him in his place. An Ark Brave member tries to stop her, but she's determined to do what her sister would do if she were there. By the way, Tino claims she's the one who deserves to join Strange Grief. The Ark Brave member reminds her that the Vice Master ordered her to stop causing trouble, but Greg adds fuel to the fire riling up the crowd and forming an improvised ring in the middle of the room. Before things get heated, Cry urges Ruta to leave. As the fight begins, the swordsman imbues his weapon with fire and attacks, but Tino completely ignores him and lands a kick on the wall in front of Cry knocking him to the ground and blocking his escape. For some reason she calls him Master and asks how long he's been there. Rodden welcomes the boy revealing that he is in fact the master of the Stragi clan. In this golden era of hunters, the capital of Zabrudia has brought forth one of the brightest talents in recent times, a man who stands above all others, the level 8 treasure hunter Cry Andri. This is an epic tale filled with glory and hardship of how Cry became the leader of the group he founded in his childhood, now the strongest clan in existence. Part of the story begins a few years ago when the Stragi had just arrived in the capital but were already breaking records by completing beginner treasure vaults. One day during an expedition Cry was too distracted to notice
noticed the approach of a monster that almost killed him but a companion saved him at the crucial moment. All the members of this team shared the same dream of becoming treasure hunters, but while the other five were talented Cry was just an ordinary guy with little spark. If he had stayed with them Cry believes, he would have started holding them back at some point. But since his friends were too kind to admit it, he decided to make the choice for them and left the group. On that day, no matter how much Andre wanted to leave the red-haired swordsman, invited him to become the clan leader and everyone else loved the idea. In other words, from that moment on Cry Andre became the head of a group made up of his childhood friends all highly gifted, though he always longed to retire from his life as a hunter. Upon hearing Ark Rodden refer to the boy as the master of First Step Ruta and Greg could hardly believe it was real. Ark approached the boy to joke that only he could manage to be late to an event like this, while Tino blocked the man's way accusing him of being a fake pretty boy. Cry was supposed to be watching the crowd from the inside, but he wasn't even wearing his uniform. Since he overslept there was no time to get ready. In the leader's mind Ark wasn't just stubborn none of the clan members ever listened to him. Tino Shade for instance was just as hard-headed. Besides being a level 4 hunter affiliated with Pigata, she was also an apprentice to Cry's childhood friend Liz. At one point Cry asked Ark if he'd accept a new member if Cry vouched for someone's potential, and when Ark said yes the entire bar went wild with anticipation, except for Ark Brave's own members who made it clear they weren't interested in adding anyone new to the team. Uninvited to the conversation Tino mentioned, it would be an honor to be chosen, but that she had already decided to follow only her master so following the fake pretty boy would be a bit complicated. The kid with the flaming sword approached with the same swagger even after embarrassing himself in the fight, but Cry seemed intrigued and asked the boy's name. He replied that he was Gilbert Bush, the Blade of Purgatory. Cry thought the boy wouldn't be useful now, but with Ark's training he might be one day. Truth be told Cry wasn't great at making judgments, and anyone he picked would be sheer luck, so he threw caution to the wind and recommended Gilbert to Ark but with one condition. With that said Cry asked Gilbert what he thought was the most important thing for a hunter, but before waiting for a response he answered himself, it's to never lose. If a hunter lacks strength, the rest of the group is put in danger, so the candidate must demonstrate the ability never to be defeated. And if you're thinking that's impossible, Cry Andre himself has never been defeated in his entire career, which is true though he's never actually been in a fight, but that part he conveniently leaves out. In any case, Cry raised one of his rings and promised to recommend anyone to Ark Brave who could retrieve this treasure. With that, he threw the ring on the ground and Gilbert prepared to grab it, but Tino kicked the guy square in the face, causing him to drop the ring and nearly die from the force of the blow. Without delay, the entire bar erupted into a brawl over the ring, except for Ruta and Greg. Casually Cry said his goodbyes to the pair, pulled up his hood and calmly walked out as the bar descended into chaos behind him. The next day Stragi's leader made the headlines following the recruitment debacle at Ark Brave. He asked his vice master who was holding the newspaper if any civilians had been hurt. Eva Renfied replied that no one had but the Adventurers Association wanted to deal with the mess. Not in the mood for it Cry asked if Ark Rodden had read the article. Eva said he had and laughed so the the leader instructed her to charge the full cost of repairing the bar to the Silver Lightning and have him handle the Adventurers Association. Hearing this, Eva complained that the leader relied too much on Ark, especially since the association had specifically asked Cry to go in person. Indeed, Cry knew that Lieutenant Gark wouldn't let this slide, so he decided to head there himself, but not without a disguise and an escort. He chose the reverse face to bring along a mask of alteration that allows its wearer to have any face they want. Eva thought no one would simply attack the leader at this hour, so the young man dropped the drama. A little while later at the Adventurers Association standing before Gark Welter manager of the Zabrudia Adventurers Association Cry Andre kneeled desperately begging for forgiveness for all the damage caused explaining that once the fight started there was no turning back but at least no civilians were harmed which was the most important thing. After all a ton of bricks is nothing but a life is worth everything and not one was lost. Besides 
Besides Cry was an old friend of the bar's owner, so the guy would forgive everyone. Lastly completely out of context the boy nervously admitted that he'd love some ice cream. With that as a form of punishment Gark handed him a book filled with missions that were either too embarrassing absurdly easy or ridiculously hard. Because of these traits hunters referred to this kind of work as paying a penance and the boy had to choose one. Thus Cry searched for an easy mission in the book to pass on to Ark and picked a level 3 rescue mission called Bone Collection. After he left Gark and his companion commented that Stragi's leader hadn't changed a bit and probably didn't even realize he'd taken the most dangerous job. When Cry got home he was so frustrated to find Ark wasn't around that he completely ignored Tino's attempts to show him that she had retrieved the challenge ring. After some persistence the boy congratulated her for the accomplishment and asked if she was free. Tino excitedly said yes but when she realized Cry was going to assign her a mission she bolted. Seeing this, the leader summoned his wolf chain which formed into Silver and sent the chain after Tino. In no time Silver subdued the poor girl and she confessed she only wanted to have ice cream with her leader but now she'd have to go on a mission to rescue five people even though she was only level four. But she wouldn't be going alone because Cry had just recruited an improvised group with Gilbert Ruda and Greg to accompany Tino to the White Wolf's nest. Going back six years the most powerful clan in the region, which didn't even have a name at the time arrives at the Adventurers Association to register their group. Cry as usual tries to dissuade the team from moving forward and doesn't even want to enter, but his companions aren't about to give up at this stage. Despite his lack of confidence he claims he'll only hold the team back, but his friends insist on having the guy as their leader no matter what and there's no backing down now. Since Cry was being a pain, the boldest of the group steps up kicking the door open as he marches into the association with all the swagger in the world introducing himself as Luke Sikol, the best swordsman in the world. At his side Liz Smart tells the guy not to hog all the spotlight so she humbly introduces herself as the most powerful blade in the universe. Then Luke goes on to explain to a staff member that he's the most incredible of all because as Cry always says, those who are truly strong don't choose their weapon, and if Luke uses a wooden sword it's obvious he's the most dangerous. With nowhere to hide his face all Cry wants is for the red-headed delinquent to stop mentioning him like that to others. Either way it's time for the kid to register the clan's name and symbol, so the receptionist hands the rookie leader a piece of paper. According to her a team's name represents its spirit. Since the youngsters hadn't even thought about this detail, it meant Cry had to come up with something on the fly. In his head, it was the perfect chance to pick a terrible name so they drop him as leader. So he drew a strange skull and named the team Strange Grief. Absolutely everyone in the group thought the name was awful so Cry used it as proof of his lack of leadership skills. But just as he threatened to step down all his friends backtracked and decided to adopt the name as if it were the most genius thing ever. And that's how the Strange Clan was born. Fast forward to the present day and Greg is left speechless upon discovering that the skinny lifeless looking kid is actually the master of the Pagata's clan known as A Thousand Tricks. Hearing this name Cray Andre reflects that it was the second title he earned as the leader of Strange because the most renowned treasure hunters usually get special names from the association and become idols. Even with everyone insisting Gilbert Bush refuses to believe this kid is all that great so Tino who never liked the guy starts complaining to the boss that there's no way she can work with this fake swordsman. And Speaking of fake, Cry himself considers himself the biggest fraud in Zabrudia because if there's one thing he's not it's the strongest in the capital as people say. But that's thanks to his clanmates constantly running their mouths proclaiming strange grief as the best thing since sliced bread. Anyway Cry wants to know if the guests are down for the mission and Gilbert is the first to respond saying this is all a joke because it's an insult for such dead weight to be at level 8. Greg tries to warn him that he's picking a fight with the wrong person person, but the swordsman doesn't care about anyone telling him what to do. So Cry shows no interest in the argument and kicks Gilbert out of the mission. With that settled, he asks Greg and Ruta if they're in, and they confirm. Gilbert, furious with the situation, expects the Master of Strange to beg for his approval, but Cry couldn't care less about the guy's refusal. Instead, Cry asks Tino to let him know if she needs anything. 
and she takes the chance to tell him she does need the master, but he makes it clear that's not happening. With everything resolved Andre turns to leave, but Gilbert Bush challenges the thousand tricks, and if he loses he'll join the group. Cry tells him that the leader of the group is Tino Shade so it's her he'll be facing. Tino never one to hold back declares she'll deliver divine punishment against Bush, using the incredible range she developed through rigorous training. Feeling confident the swordsman promises not to hold back and challenges Cry again once he's done beating her. The last thing Cry wants is to fight obviously but Tino catches the challenger's attention warning him that although she's the same level 4 as Gilbert, she's still trash compared to the master. To make the fight even more thrilling she drops her weapons and decides to take on the opponent with her fists. Cry figures Tino should be able to handle this cocky guy but that sword he uses the blade of purgatory might tip the scales or even turn the fight in his favor depending on the skills the user has. However Gilbert mirrors his opponent's move and lets go of his weapon as well. Tino announces that after she destroys this guy she'll go have ice cream with the master but Cry doesn't seem too excited about the idea. The rogue throws a tantrum to get what she wants so the boss relents just to keep the peace. Motivated Tino now has the perfect excuse to fight like there's no tomorrow and with that in mind she charges at Bush with surprising speed. Gilbert narrowly dodges the first blow, but there's nothing he can do about the leg sweep that comes next, and so he takes his first beating of the day. Determined the guy doesn't give up and strikes back at the girl, but she easily dodges the attack and mocks him for challenging her master. Even though he seemed completely beaten Gilbert makes a comeback and regains control of his body. Then Shade lands a slap on the guy's neck putting an end to the poor man. Or at least that's what what everyone thought. Because while the others had already written the swordsman off as defeated, he digs deep into an old memory and remembers that he was born to be a hunter. From a very young age he could outmatch even some adults in swordsmanship, and it didn't take long for him to grow up and head to the capital to chase the career he so badly desired. Soon enough he had formed a group and sold off several treasure vaults, and this success gave him the feeling that he was invincible. Now faced with the present situation he snaps back to reality as his rival calls out to him. She tells him that he better use his sword if he wants any chance of surviving. Gilbert refuses, but she warns that pride means nothing when you're dead. Whether he likes it or not the swordsman agrees, though the truth is he can't accept being weaker than his opponent. Cry steps in and tells Gilbert that they're quite similar. Just like Bush left his last group because of the strength gap between him and the others Cry went through the same thing. But in Cry's case no one was left behind, or rather they they didn't let him stay behind no matter how much he wanted to. But Cry leaves that unsaid. Hearing this Gilbert is struck by the idea that Cry is benevolent, even with the most feared clan in the capital. He starts to see the thousand tricks as some kind of entity. Meanwhile, Andre touches the defeated man's sword identifies the elemental damage and enhanced attack range and remarks that it's a simple but good weapon so the swordsman should take care of it. Realizing that this man used his sword far better than he ever could reaching a flame he'd never grasped despite having had the blade for years Gilbert Bush yells that this is impossible and calls the leader of Strange a monster. Next cry Andre explains that mana material is considered the world's fundamental substance, but despite being everywhere it can't be seen with the naked eye. Treasure vaults are a phenomenon where spiritual lines and other forces condense mana material manifesting limited alternate worlds based on memories drawn from the core of the world. The rules governing this phenomenon are studied in many kingdoms, but they are still not fully understood. The White Wolf's Nest is one of those treasure vaults. It was originally inhabited by lupine monsters is called Silver Moon, but they were hunted to extinction for their pelt. Afterward the vault appeared along with a blood-stained ghost in the form of a wolf. After reading this in the newspaper, the young man gets a bit scared and points out that a treasure vault that's a vengeful reflection of history is a bit too much. Eva Renfied argues that it was Cry himself who put the group in this situation, but he assures her that his team has the level to overcome the challenge since the vault is level 3 and they'll have 4 people plus Tino 
is coming along. By the way, the boy thanks her for telling him that Gilbert Bush had left the group because he was able to use that information at just the right moment. Moving on the clan's vice master mentions that the master put on quite a show with a relic in the training room. He replies that it was easy to control especially since even Gilbert managed to use it a little without any real knowledge. Speaking of which, Cry loves collecting relics with all kinds of powers and shapes. By the way, he'd love to know if Bush would sell the Purgatory Blade. Hearing this, Eva loses her patience and points out that the boss already has several relics similar to that sword, and on top of that he even took out a loan from Citri due to debts. Even though he receives an equal commission with all the other strange members, the clan doesn't generate infinite money. Embarrassed, Cry looks for a counterargument, but can only remember that he needs someone to recharge his relics. So he goes to two allies, and while the woman is recharging the relics, the man tells him that a ghost in the shape of a wolf appeared near the white wolf's nest and destroyed an entire caravan with level 3 escorts. Cry thinks his team will handle it without any issues, but the man stresses that the ghosts in the area have been growing stronger. The woman adds that Rudolph Devu, a powerful level 5 lancer, has also shown up there and Cry remembers that this guy is on the wanted list for the guild job he took. Worried that the mission might fail, the leader hopes Gilbert has recharged the Purgatory Blade. Speaking of the team which is already on its way to the Nestino, doesn't help the atmosphere by revealing that she left a will before setting out. After all, if her master sent her on this mission, it means it won't be easy. Still, she believes that Andre would never assign her a random group. On the other hand, every other member of the group, except for Tino, thinks this is the most random team possible. Either way, Gilbert accepted the job because the thousand tricks knew even why he left his old group. Tino explains that the guy is a genius at deduction and has extensive knowledge about the capital and its surroundings so he must have deduced this fact from Gilbert's words. Ruta doubts this quite a bit, but Greg figures that only such a methodical mind could have coldly calculated that bar incident. Taking advantage of this speech, Tino reinforces that the master planned everything for the mission to go smoothly without major scares and would never send a group to their deaths without careful thought. And speaking of the devil, after sending a group to their deaths, without thinking Cry decides to catch up with them in time to order them to abort the mission. Back with the team, they barely arrive before encountering a ghost wielding a sword and shield at a level well beyond that of humans. Meanwhile, Cry is rummaging through endless clutter searching for relics. Eva scolds him for carrying a citri slime which is banned by Imperial law, but the boy doesn't have time to waste and will have to make do. So he takes off flying with this broken and unstable relic which might just make this young man's last flight. If you're enjoying this journey don't forget to hit that like button your support helps motivate me to keep bringing you each episode. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss an update.